back, we are talking about protein structure and function in foods. And this is part two of the video series. You may have watched the previous video about protein structure, where we're specifically looking at primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins. Today, we're going to talk more about how that structure impacts on the function of protein within foods and how we as food scientists can manipulate that structure to our advantage using a variety of different uh, chemical means. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to identify key ways that pro food proteins are restructured in food systems. We'll discuss the impact of denatrition on food proteins and discuss different food-based examples which demonstrate different protein restructuring and denatrition methods. Why all this attention to protein? Well, right now, protein is incredibly important from a commodity perspective. The meat industry has been long standing as a, I want to say, a foundation within the Canadian food manufacturing sector, but we're also seeing the rise in plant-based proteins and understanding how to structure those proteins is really, really vital. Milk and all of the derivative products, so cheeses and yogurts and so on, these are also artful presentations of protein restructuring. And so thinking about what you are doing intentionally as you are going about doing your formulation work has a lot of impact on what results you're going to get. So as just a quick reminder, we talked about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary protein structure in the previous video. Primary is where we're looking at the sequence of amino acids in a protein. And then we're looking at secondary protein structure, how it's folding on itself because of the hydrogen bonding and the different um, charge-based interactions or hydrophilic hydrophobic interactions within that protein based off of the amino acids. Then we see those uh, pleated sheets or helices folding in on the tertiary structure of the protein to create the net structure. And then quaternary protein structure is where multiple protein subunits are coming together using a variety of different molecular interactions. We'll talk about what those molecular interactions are right now, actually. <laughs> Here's a great, um, a great slide summarizing this. And First off, we've got electrostatic interactions. Some of the amino acids, if you recall from the previous video, we had some charts of amino acids. And my outcome for the students at Niagara College is not to memorize them, but to be able to quickly source it and to think about what those structures are. So some amino acids have positive and some have negative charges and positive likes to move towards negative charges and vice versa. So that's what's called an electrostatic interaction. Second of all, we can have hydrogen bonds, and that's where we are seeing um, the partial charges between hydrogen and oxygen interacting between amino acids and, and also within a variety of other uh, molecules within food systems. Third, we've got disulfide bonds. Some of the amino acids are sulfur amino acids, and those sulfurs can form cross-linked bonds. And we'll talk about some food-based examples, but uh, just to give away the secret, Bread and the gluten proteins in bread are formed by disulfide bonds. And so some of the functional ingredients that we can have to either enhance uh, gluten strength or decrease gluten strength relate to their interaction with those disulfide bonds. Four, we can have dipole-dipole interactions. And that's, again, if, if you remember back to our, our videos on water, as we were looking at partial charges within molecules. And those partial charges like to interact. Last but not least, you've got hydrophobic interactions. And in the case of the folding of the proteins, hydrophilic, the, the, the amino acids that like water, because proteins are usually in biological systems, and biological systems are mostly water, the hydrophilic amino acids tend to congregate on the outsides of the proteins, while the hydrophobic ones tend to get smushed, to use a really good scientific term, they tend to get hidden within the internal part of the protein. And as such, that's something that we can take advantage of by changing the dynamics of the protein or adding the mechanical shear to the protein as well. So all of these different types of interactions are occurring in all proteins. Now, some of them dominate in different systems, and we can manipulate all of these using a variety of different means as food product developers. So let's carry on. Denaturation. 
is a term that we're going to toss around a lot. And denaturation is the protein where we're transforming that well-structured protein that's being formed under all those uh, normal physiological or biologic conditions, and we're going to change its state using non-physiologic conditions. So food, if you really think about it, food came from biological stuff is a really good scientific term. Um, plants, animals, they produced the tissues that we are then converting into food. So they were under biologic conditions, and now we are manipulating them as food scientists into non-physiologic or non-biologic conditions. By heating or adding mechanical energy or shear, we can change the salt or the pH characteristics in ways that would never occur in biology, but give us desirable impacts on that product. So denaturation can be done over a narrow range of conditions, and we can manipulate that. Most denaturation is very, very difficult to reverse. And uh, this is a one example where scientists have, um, food scientists and protein scientists in particular have been exploring how can you renature proteins after they've been denatured and the, the challenge is how can you uncook an egg um, most of the time we are artfully denaturing proteins as food scientists and taking advantage in that it can increase the stability of those proteins and maintain the nutritional quality over the long haul so denaturation can be good and so in many cases we want to degrade uh, proteins by enzymes. We can enhance the structure of foods like cheese, tofu, and yogurt. So if you remember from our class, we made cheese. Well, we didn't have a lot of, uh, well, there is structure in milk, but that structure doesn't turn into cheese just magically. We had to manipulate it through the use of rennet enzymes and through heat, through modification of pH, and so on. Same with our yogurt and our tofu. In some cases, good denaturation is occurring where we are removing negative proteins. So, for example, in the case of beans and legumes, there are actual proteins that act as anti-nutritional factors. If those proteins were to get into our guts intact, they would actually bind to the surface of our intestinal uh, lumen, the, the surface of our intestines, and it would block the absorption of protein and other nutrients. And those anti-nutritional proteins we can quickly remove by heating. So don't eat raw chickpeas or eat raw kidney beans. That's <laughs> it's a, a silly one, but there's truth to that. Seeds have these anti-nutritional proteins because the purpose of eating seeds was actually to hopefully get some seeds across in the feces to another location to be pooped out and planted with a good nutritional source for that plant to grow. By having those anti-nutritional factors within the seeds, it prevented the animal who ate that seed from actually digesting the seed, leaving the seed intact so that it could grow somewhere else. In some cases, denaturation is bad. And so, for example, a good, uh, very visible example that we see at the grocery store and in meat processing is where we see meat losing its red color. The red color of meat is based off of myoglobin and to a lesser extent hemoglobin within the meat. And those um, hemoglobin type proteins can be denatured so that you have the bright red color and it turns into a dark purple or brown color. And no one wants to buy brown colored meat that hasn't been cooked. In some cases, protein denaturation can cause loss of texture, and you can have also enzymes or proteins. And we'll talk about enzymes in, a, in the next slideshow. If you want enzymes to be active in your food, you want to make sure that you're not denaturing them. And in other cases, you want to denature them because they're causing negative effects within your food, such as uh, browning or... Um, proteases that are degrading the protein quality within your product. Enzymes can be good or bad, so sometimes we want to denature them. So as I mentioned before, there are different types of denaturation. They can be occurring from temperature. They can be caused by organic solvents. So in the case of food systems, we mostly see this by the application of 
ethanol within food products. Um, a good example, if you've ever tried to make homemade Irish cream or like a Bailey's type product, we always joke that it's mysterious and magical that the protein in the milk remains soluble because organic solvents are actually quite good at precipitating proteins and denaturing them. Changing the pH is a really, really simple way of um, denaturing protein, and that's quite common within food systems. In many cases, we see denaturation uh, by pH from fermentation, and in other cases, we're adding acid as an ingredient to get that denaturation. Salt, and the uh, when I say salt, I could mean sodium chloride, but it could also mean other organic salts or other inorganic salts, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride. Um, these are all capable of denaturing protein. Last but not least, we often forget about this one, but sheer energy, that's mechanical energy. And so if you are physically applying enough mechanical energy to a protein, you can actually denature it. And so if you were to extrude a protein or whip it hard enough, you can actually denature the protein as well. So what's going on? We've got those native proteins and under the appropriate conditions, they are going to be maintained in their standard structure. But then we start to change pH, heat, um, salts, ionic strengths and so on. And we start to see changes in the interactions because of the systems that are out there. So for example, if we have a lot of charge-based interaction within those proteins, let's say the amino acids, negatively charged amino acids are now interacting with calcium salts, for example. Calcium salts are positively charged and they have two positive charges. We can change the dynamic of what is going on in the biologic system. So we change the interaction with some of those non-covalent interactions, so hydrophobic bonds, or we can change the interaction with the disulfide bonds. This is the fun of being a food scientist is that as soon as you know this, a lot of understanding what you're doing and why you are adding different ingredients suddenly makes sense. And we'll, we'll keep parsing through this. So as I mentioned before, in many cases, the protein structures that we're seeing are occurring because we have hydrophobic interactions. So the amino acids that are hydrophobic within our food, we can denature the protein and enhance. As I mentioned before, hydrophobic amino acids like to hide within the center of the proteins. And if we can somehow get those hydrophobic proteins to the outside, then they will want to stick together. And so we can form gels or we can form uh, networks between those proteins. Sulfur bonds, again, cysteine amino acids have sulfur and we can form disulfide bonds across proteins. We can cross-link proteins with enzymes. Transglutaminase is a good example, uh, commonly known as meat glue. But there you're taking a glutamate residue and you're forming a cross-link across glutamate residues. And as I mentioned before, charge-based effects, where we can take advantage of the fact that a lot of amino acids have negative charge to a lesser extent positive charge, but most biologic proteins have a net negative charge. We can take advantage of it and introduce positive cations into the system, calcium, magnesium, and so on, that will create bonds across the system. I like this diagram, I really do. I want you to keep thinking about all those different types of bonds that are occurring because we're going to jump into some systems here. Proteins are viscoelastic and so if you think about uh, our great example is bread dough. If uh, we build into that that um, protein network there's a capability of stretching and slowly returning back to their original shape. And something that we do within bread is we manipulate the viscoelastic properties of the gluten by changing the protein systems. So if you have a normal gluten protein, you form those disulfide bonds. Let's jump back here. Those disulfide bonds that we see here that is the protein linkage that's occurring in the formation of gluten between the glutalin and gliadin proteins. If we were to add a sulfuring agent, potassium metabisulfite, or um, actually potassium metabisulfite is likely the best example, it's a dough conditioning agent. And if you were to add that sulfiding agent 
to your dough. Let's say you've got your dough and you're stretching it and then you release it. Under a standard dough, it's going to shrink back on itself. If you add a sulfiding agent, that viscoelastic structure is gone within the bread. And so you'll often see uh, sulfiding agents or you will often see the addition of free L-cysteine as a dough conditioning agent because it locks up those sulfite bonds. If you are blocking the capability of it interacting with other proteins, you're not going to form that viscoelastic gel in your bread. So sulfiding agents or free cysteine can be used to modify the viscoelastic structures within breads by blocking disulfide bond formation. Oh, so what we're in essence doing is if we're adding cysteine or we're adding sulfite, we're blocking that formation from occurring at number three. What right, isoelectric point. So in, in this case, we've got a graph here where we've got solubility of your protein and pH. Now, every protein has a different isoelectric characteristic, but what's going on here? As the pH changes, the charge ratio of the protein changes. So each of the amino acids that has a positive or negative charge has a slightly different um, pK value. And so in essence, under different pH conditions, the, the amino acid will either have a charge or be neutral. And if you think about it, those charges, if it has a positive or negative charge, helps it interact with water. The more charges you have, the more charges you have, the more interaction with water. The more interaction with water, the better the solubility. So if you have a protein that has a lot of charges, you also have to note that as you change the pH, those charges can either, uh, they're going to, uh, I have to think about it on an individual basis. The amino acid at different pHs is either going to be charged or not. And then you have to think of it on a net basis in that you've got a whole mix of different amino acids. And as the pH changes, some of them are going to lose their charge. More of them are going to lose their charge. And you change the solubility based off of the pH. So you're changing the charge ratio. So what you can do is weigh out protein and adjust the pH and you will see a change in solubility. Every protein reacts differently. In general, for example, milk protein, you see this reduction of solubility in the um, pH 4 to pH 5 range and then the uh, solubility increases again. We can take advantage of this by, uh, for example, if you're creating protein isolates, Let's say you're grinding up soybeans, you can push it into this alkaline region where the protein solubility is very high, adding sodium hydroxide, centrifuge out all of the starch and fiber fractions, and then you can drop the pH back down so that your protein becomes insoluble and you can isolate that protein out. It's just as simple as using um, sodium hydroxide and hyd uh, hydrochloric acid, and those may sound really, really nasty, Sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid neutralize out to sodium chloride or table salt. And so the only contaminant remaining within the product is table salt. And as such, when people see uh, protein isolate on a product, you're taking advantage of the isoelectric point shifting to be able to create that. Also, we see uh, isoelectric point shifting in cheeses and yogurts and the solubility of the protein will indicate the melting properties. So for example, if you've got a, a, a cheese like a feta cheese where the pH is pushing around four, the solubility of the proteins is quite low versus in the case of a mozzarella cheese where your pH is maybe pushing 5.5, part of the protein is insoluble and part of the protein is still soluble. And as such, you get a cheese with a really good melting capability. And a lot of that comes down to um, the pH of the final cheese, and that indicates how much melt and stretch you're going to get on that cheese. How about water binding? So in the case of some protein networks, 
you are forming this interaction between each protein, either by charge base or by hydrophobic interaction. And so what you're forming is this nice little network of proteins across one another. We see this in the case of tofu, we see this in the case of yogurt, where we're forming this gel-based network. In the case of yogurt, we're changing the isoelectric properties slowly, and as such, we get a nice gel. We are dropping the pH, or we're dropping the pH slowly by metabolism of the, the sugars uh, within the yogurt or within the milk, creating lactic acid. That lactic acid is then shifting the isoelectric point so that we slowly, slowly are changing the solubility and we form a gel. In the case of tofu, we're slowly uh, building calcium or magnesium bridges across the proteins in the soy milk and forming a gel. So those gels contain pores and there's water and salts and other things in between. And depending on the strength of that gel, that gel can start to contract on itself and we see what's called synergesis. So a good example is when you were a kid, you would get that yogurt in your lunchbox and you'd find that layer of yogurt water on the top. That is synergesis, where the gel starts to contract and liquid gets expelled from that gel. And that comes from stronger interaction of the protein with the other proteins. You can see synergesis in other types of gels, starch-based gels and so on. But um, thinking about from a from a gel strength and a protein interaction, that's where we're going with this. Casein is really fun. Uh, casein uh, obviously is the basis under which we're making cheese. And so the diagram that I've got here is cheese and that we're seeing a whole pile of different systems all working in concert. So first off, we've got casein as a protein and casein is, is really cool because it's got these long, um, long side arms on it what are called um, these paracappa casein sidearms, when it gets cleaved off with rennet or chymosin, those then allow the paracappa casein to interact both on a hydrophobic basis with one another, but also on a charge basis. So we start to see charge based interactions with the phosphate and calcium within the milk too. And that allows this wonderful network of uh, casein micelles to occur. So paracappa casein first gets cleaved and we're losing that, uh, that negative charge, that negative net charge on the protein. And then we're seeing divalent salt bridging as well as another interaction. So lots of different interactions occurring within cheese we mentioned already cheese and its solubility based off of its pH. Lots and lots of different interactions occurring and that's the art of cheese making such that we can take milk, bacterial culture, rennet and salt and be able to create so much diversity. Other cool thing about milk proteins is that you've got a wide variety of proteins. We think milk protein but no there's actually casein proteins which are globular and dense. And then we've got whey proteins, and these are long, loose, and uh, flexible uh, proteins. And we can take advantage of whey protein functionality in the case of other types of function. Uh, protein can be used for emulsification and stabilization of foams because, again, we'll, we'll have a second video um, at a later point that talks about um, dispersions. I think that video is actually already made. In the case of dispersions, you can take advantage of the fact that you have to stabilize an interface, whether that's a fat to water interface or an air to water interface. Proteins are really neat because in the case of their uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic obviously wants to interact with the water phase and hydrophobic will either interact with the fat phase or with the air phase and in the case of whey proteins, you've got these loose and flexible chain-like proteins that have a lot of uh, mix of hydrophilic, pardon me, hydrophilic and hydrophobic mix. And whey protein has a wonderful capability of interacting across the surface of different um, emulsions or different uh, 
dispersed systems. So as I mentioned before, you can stabilize foams or emulsions with proteins because the proteins will often adsorb to surfaces based off of their hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions. And that's where we're starting to see something called steric hindrance. So imagine you've got a whey protein coating a fat particle in an emulsion. That whey protein, the hydrophobic part is going to interact with the fat and the hydrophilic or partial charge component is going to interact with the water phase. In other cases, you can have proteins uh, coat and use um, electrostatic interactions. So that's where, again, as we know, proteins and their structures tend to have a net negative charge. And in the case of these proteins, if they're coating the particles, the net negative charge is going to um, contribute to the surface of the uh, globules within the emulsion. I think this is my last slide, but um, one last component to talk about is myoglobin in meat products. And as we, as we mentioned in the previous slideshow, myoglobin and to a lesser extent hemoglobin within foods are pigmented proteins. These have an iron clathrate ring within the center of the quaternary structure. And so that iron clathrate ring contributes to the coloration of the protein. So typically when we're buying meat at the store or buying meat through uh, meat processing, we are looking for a bright red coloration. And that be is occurring because it is an, in an oxymyoglobin form and it's fully oxygenated. It can be deoxygenated and it will turn into a purple form. And if you've ever bought... Um, wholesale meat in vac packs, oftentimes it comes and it's this, this dark, uh, dark purple coloration. As soon as you open up the plastic wrap and allow it to be exposed to um, oxygen, then you start to see that coloration occur and you see the blooming color on the product. But you can have this um, irreversible uh, change to metmyoglobin or brown coloration in the in the protein and that can be occurring from heat it can also be occurring from pH change and there's all sorts of different interventions that food processors are looking at to be able to maintain red coloration in meat to ensure that it remains fresh and desirable for consumers but it has to be balanced by the fact that if meat's too old it could be spoiled and have a variety of different pathogens or spoilage organisms that could be contributing uh, negatively to human health. So this is a real art form for food scientists to think about. What are means that we can maintain the coloration of the meat and allow it to remain in a fresh looking state while uh, also uh, making sure that we're not overstepping our bounds and taking advantage of the fact that Oftentimes when we're seeing brown discolored meat, it's because it's old. So lots of different things to think about. Uh, I'm just in quick summary as we're closing off here. Some food based examples. So here's some tofu that looks great. I like tofu. Um, tofu is a good example where if you remember, we were making tofu in class. We used calcium sulfate or calcium chloride or magnesium chloride and calcium or magnesium have two positive charges. So we're using a divalent ion to bridge those negatively charged proteins across using a positively charged cation from the salt in the ingredient. In the case of yogurt, yum, we are modifying the isoelectric properties. So the bacterial culture within the yogurt is slowly metabolizing the lactose sugar, creating lactic acid, and that's slowly decreasing the protein solubility and allowing for a gel to form. And that gel looks really delicious with some granola and blueberries on top. Now, if you think about ricotta cheese, honestly, you can ask yourself, well, what's the difference? I am acidifying the milk. In the case of ricotta cheese, though, we're doing it quite quickly and the gel doesn't have the chance to stabilize. Instead, the protein collapses on itself and flocculates because the acidification occurs extremely fast. And that fast 
that fast acidification and loss of uh, protein solubility means that the protein flocculates instead of forms a gel. And if you were to filter out the flocculated protein, you end up with ricotta cheese, which is delicious in its own right. As I mentioned before in the slideshow, cheese is a real concert of all of these different interactions occurring. So rennet, we're removing the paracapa casein, we're seeing hydrophobic interaction, we're seeing calcium and phosphate divalent bridges within the protein um, structure. pH changes from fermentation is going to change the solubility. And we've got all sorts of protein fat moisture interactions allowing for plasticity within the cheeses or lack of plasticity. In some cases, we want the cheese to be dry and crumbly. So lots of different interactions within cheese. And that's the wonder and fun of cheese making is thinking about controlling all of these different interactions. I think that's it for this slideshow. I've got some more slideshows coming up, but again, think about all of the different interactions that are occurring when working with protein. Think about all the different denaturation that may be occurring and how are you restructuring through either modification of uh, process parameters or by modification of your formulation. Watch out for the next video. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.